Good morning. Uh, right, today we're going to talk about NP. I know you all know about NP from 251, but you know it's so great. We're going to do it all again. Uh, so I want to start a little actually by recapping a, a few things I mentioned last time about SAT because it's good motivation for today's lecture. So uh, you know, recall we talked some about um, three SAT. Problem with checking if a given CNF formula with at most three literals per clause is satisfiable. And you can do it with a brute force solution in time about two to the n. And you know, one thing I mentioned to try to pique your interest a little bit is that you can actually do it a bit faster than that. Still exponential time, but it was something like 1.34 to the n time. You know, with an interesting algorithm. So that's interesting. And <clears throat> there's a similar algorithm or similar things you can do for ksat when k is bigger than 3 that are a little bit better than brute force. So as I mentioned, uh, ksat for any fixed k, you can do it in time a little bit less than 2 to the n, something like 2 minus a constant over k to the n. Okay, so as k gets bigger, it gets closer and closer to 2 to the n, but still for any fixed k, it's, it's better than 2 to the n. Okay, so you know the big question on this topic is whether 3SAT might be in P. Can you get this smart algorithm all the way down to polynomial time? And uh, you know what we'll talk about today and next time is uh, the following. You know, at first it might not look so interesting because it's just about one problem. I mean, you know, there's thousands of problems we're interested in. Why should we care so much about whether this particular problem is in and P is in P? Um, but as I've mentioned before, and as I think you may know, thanks to this theory of NP completeness, which we're going to start to study, um, whether or not this is in P, like directly impacts and is equivalent to, in fact, whether or not thousands and thousands of other problems that we care about are in P or not. So it's a fact that we'll see that this is three sides in P, if and only if, let's say, circuit side is in P, which is if and only if, uh, you know, three colorability is in P. You show on homework how to do that in 2 to the n time, but polynomial time is a lot harder, if and only if this k-clique problem I mentioned is in P. Um, you know, if and only if, actually, you know, literally thousands of interesting problems that we don't know to be in P are in P. And in fact, <clears throat> one of these thousands of problems, it's actually if and only if every language in well, this class called NP is NP. Okay, so it's, NP is what we'll talk about today. It's a complexity class that contains, you know, thousands and thousands of interesting, I mean, literally comp, uh, thousands of interesting computational problems, uh, you know, many of which we don't know whether or not they can be done in polynomial time. And as we'll see, this is the content of a theorem called cook levin theorem. All these thousands of problems are doable in polynomial time or they're all not doable in polynomial time. They're all doable in polynomial time if and only if one particular one of them, like 3SAT, is doable in polynomial time. And you know, since people have been working very hard for many years, which may you get fast algorithms for them and failed, well, this is kind of why we think they're probably all not in polynomial time. <clears throat> now, actually, all this is about stronger conjectures. You know, I, I've been talking here about, like, wow, can we get 3SAT solvable in, you know, n to the 10 time or some polynomial time? which is actually very far from what we know, which is like 1.34 to the n time. There's actually many time bounds in between there, like n to the log n time or 2 to the square root n time. And uh, you may even ask, like, why do we, you know, jump immediately to this question about polynomial time? And in fact, you don't have to. So I want to actually bring this up before I get to the main topic of today, which is, uh, okay, so here are some conjectures. Um, and the most famous of them is called P does not equal NP. And as I sort of mentioned up here, and we'll see in the next couple of classes, although it's not the, the definition of P does not equal NP, this is equivalent to the question, or uh, to the conjecture that 3SAT cannot be solved in polynomial time. <clears throat> but, you know, you see, we don't even know how to solve it in two to the n to the 0.99 time. And you can conjecture that that's also impossible. And there's a, another conjecture that's a little less popular, but 
I like very much, called ETH. That stands for Exponential Time Hypothesis. And you know, it's exactly this. Um, there exists a positive number delta such that 3sat cannot be done in like 1 plus delta to the n time. Okay, so it says that, okay, maybe you can get it down to 1.31 to the n. Actually, that's true. Or 1.2 to the n, or 1.01 to the n, but there's some limit. Like, maybe you cannot do it in time 1.0001 to the n. Or roughly equivalently, it's saying, like, you can't get, like, a really sub-exponential algorithm. Like, even 2 to the n to the 0.99 is impossible. Uh, so this, of course, is stronger than this. Uh, ETH implies P does not equal NP. And... Um, as we'll see, maybe a later in this uh, class, not today, but the semester, it implies some other things that are interesting that we don't know how to prove, just assuming P does not equal NP. In fact, <coughs> there's an even stronger one called Seth, which is the strong exponential time hypothesis. And it says the following. It's about KSAT. It says, um, for all delta greater than 0, there exists a large enough k such that ksat cannot be done in time 2 minus delta to the n. So this is kind of in the other direction. It says, you know, you give me any number that's really close to 2, like 1.99999 then, you know, there's some k, like maybe 100, such that, you know, 100 sat cannot even be done in time, 1.99999 to the n. So, I mean, it's almost kind of like saying that CNF sat, the problem where you don't have an upper bound on k, has no better algorithm than just 2 to the n. And this, this one obviously implies this one. ETH obviously implies that p does not equal np. Uh, this is a bit less obvious, but it's true. I mean, it's suggested, of course, by the name. The strong exponential time hypothesis is stronger than the exponential time hypothesis. Uh, you'd have to think a little bit about how to prove that. Uh, maybe we will later in the semester or not. Um, but basically, you need to show that uh, if you had a very, very fast algorithm for 3sat, like a sub-exponential time algorithm for 3sat, you could use it to get a sub-exponential time algorithm or a very fast algorithm for ksat. So that's true, I'll just tell you. And so these are even stronger conjectures than P does not equal NP, and therefore maybe we should be less confident in them. You know, I would say I, I personally like think this one's for sure. I also kind of think this one's very likely. This one, I would still go for it, but I, you know, I, you know, it's getting even stronger, so I can't say I have as much confidence. Um, now why am I telling you all this? I mean, okay, it's interesting, and it's going to motivate our study of 3sat. But I want to mention one more cool thing. Um, as I mentioned, you know, the reason people have studied these conjectures is that you can actually use them to prove things that you cannot prove just assuming p does not equal np. And here's one by uh, Aboud and uh, uh, Vasilevska and um, I forget the third person. I remember him, but I forget his name. Anyway, this is a theorem that was proved uh, last year, two years ago. Um, if you assume this hypothesis about the hardness of ksat, that implies um, for all epsilon greater than zero, you cannot solve the longest common subsequence problem. Remember that from a couple uh, lectures ago. In time, order n to the 2 minus epsilon. So if you remember longest common subsequence problem, it's a very simple kind of string problem uh, that arises in like, I don't know, bioinformatics and stuff. Just find the longest common subsequence of two strings. It's even easier than computing the edit distance of two strings. And we saw last time a dynamic programming algorithm that runs in time n squared. And if n is like a billion or a trillion, which it really could be in bio applications, actually an n squared time algorithm kind of stinks. I mean, a billion squared is a lot. People have been striving for, you know, decades to like maybe get and so 1.5 time algorithm or a linear time algorithm. And this is a big blow. I mean, it doesn't look very related, but if you believe this thing, 
Um, and you can't beat quadratic time for this simple problem. So I like this example a lot, I mean, because it's an example of like a complexity theorem that's, you know, a little bit different maybe from the ones you see like, uh, I don't know, at first in class. It's a hard, it's kind of a hardness result within polynomial time. Okay, any question? Okay, cool. So, uh, all right. <clears throat> that was a little bit of motivation. And now let's talk about well, NP. Okay. <clears throat> so what is NP? Okay, well, NP is a complexity class, as we see. It's a, it, it's a collection of um, decision problems. Uh, what the N and the P stand for, I guess I'll tell you eventually, but it's, it's a poorly chosen name. Uh, anyway, let me tell you first the idea. So, you know, especially when we're talking about algorithms, we saw that for many problems, you know, interesting problems, there was a brute force solution that sort of followed a common paradigm, brute force algorithm, that looked like uh, this. Um, it was kind of enumerate. <coughs> you know, exponentially many, unfortunately, candidate solutions. This is somehow a solution, S-O-L-N with the line. And uh, then check each one to see if it's a genuine solution. And then polynomial time for each one Uh, okay, maybe I didn't write that sentence extremely correctly, but when I give the examples, remind you of the examples, I think it'll be clear. So let me remind you, you know, last Thursday, I think, we talked about like a bunch of problems that are in uh, P, but they also had some brute force algorithms, and let's see how those work. So let's see. Let me kind of make a little table here. Candidate solutions. And then there's like a poly time check if it's a genuine solution. And then there's a problem. Okay, <clears throat> so uh, one problem that we talked about was called path or ST path. Well, this was given a graph and two vertices S and T, and you had to check if there was a path from S to T in the graph. And this was not the best strategy, but there is a natural brute force strategy uh, suggested by the definition of the problem, which is just try all possible paths, basically. So a candidate solution here would look like a sequence of vertices, um, you know, V1, V2, up to VL, where we can assume that L is at most N, N standing for the number of vertices in the graph. And you could just like blindly enumerate all of these, there's like at most N to the N of them. And then what did you do given such a, a sequence? Well, you just checked if it was a real solution, so you would check that S1, sorry, that S is V1, and that T is VL, and, okay, that's kind of trivial. The main thing you would check is that VI, VI plus 1 is in E for all I. Okay, so just having written down this potential path, you just check if it's like an actual path from S to T. Okay, so that's sort of uh, the framework that we were talking about before. Let me give you another uh, similar thing, uh, similar problem. This one we didn't explicitly mention, but I, I imagine you, well, I know you saw it in 251. It's called Hamiltonian path. It's a very similar problem. Um, again, you're given a graph and two vertices S and T, and you have to check if there's a path from S to T, but there's an extra twist. The path 
has to touch every vertex exactly once. Okay, that's Hamiltonian path, if you had forgotten. So you can similarly solve this with an extremely similar uh, brute force algorithm. In fact, the candidate solutions are exactly the same thing. Um, and you just have to check, or you can insist in this case that L equals N if you like. But again, you'll just check that S is the first vertex, T is the last vertex, all the edges are present, oh, sorry, all the consecutive vertices really are edges, and the main thing that the set of vertices on the path is exactly the set of all vertices. Okay, so if the length is n and it touches all the vertices, then it hits each vertex exactly once. Okay, that's the Hamiltonian path problem. Uh, oops. Let's do one more that's similar to this. Uh, I'll do a couple more. Mm, how about the three coloring problem? So given a graph, an undirected graph, I know you know about it because of the homework, your candidate solutions would look like uh, colorings of the vertices, you know, C1 through Cn, where Cis are, you know, red, uh, blue, and yellow. And the checking, so enumerating all these, of course, is 3 to the n. And, you know, checking them, though, is easy. Once you have a uh, candidate coloring, you just check if it's valid. Okay, which means that um, CI differs from CJ for all IJ that are in edge. I have to delete this lovely idea. Um, so I want to give you a couple more examples. Uh, another problem with this flavor that we've talked about is even talked about a lot last time is circuit sat. Remember there you're given a circuit and you're trying to see if there is an input that makes it output one. So the candidate solutions are all the inputs. Let's call them y and 0, 1 to the n. Remember now n denotes the number of input wires for the circuit. And then what do you do to check? Well, it's exactly this problem that I called circuit eval. I mean, the checking algorithm is just you got the circuit, you got the y, you do circuit evaluation to see what the circuit evalu uh, outputs on this y. Okay, and one more I want to mention. It's a bit number theoretic, composites. This is a language or a decision problem. Basically, you're given a number and you want to know if it's composite. So this is the language of all encodings of numbers b, such that b is a natural number and b is composite, so in other words, not prime, and I guess not zero or one either. Okay, can somebody suggest uh, like a natural brute force algorithm for this problem of the same flavor? You're in 112 and you're checking if it's composite. <laughs> what do you do? Yeah? Yeah, so, you know, the, the candidate solutions, in some sense, are, um, you know, all the encodings of numbers d, such that maybe two, d is at least two, and d for divisor, and at most b. And then what do you check? You check, you know, if b, b is divisible by d. So if b mod d is zero. Hey, that's a... Uh, Due to the n time algorithm for checking if a number is composite, composite, if b is an n digit number, well, you have to remember how to check if one super long number is divisible by another super long number, but you learned how to do that in third or fourth grade, so that's okay. You can do it in polynomial time. <coughs> okay, so um, these problems are all, these five problems here are all problems that are in the complexity class NP. And they're in the complexity class and P because they kind of have this uh, nature. Okay, which, I mean, I'm eventually going to write something truly formal, but let me write some more ideas. I mean, the two problem features that these problems all share 
I'll enumerate them from 0 to 1. First, um, this is less important, so I call it 0. Uh, the candidate solutions are encodable by strings of polynomial length. Okay, so actually it's a little bit like saying yeah, there are at most exponentially many candidate solutions. And that's a, that's a typical scenario in problems like this. I mean, the, the candidate solutions you're looking for are themselves not insanely long compared to the input. That's more of a technical point. This is the main point, one. So I'll put a little star. Um, it's the existence of the third column. That's the real point. It's, there exists uh, an efficient algorithm uh, to check if a candidate solution is like a real solution. Right, it's like that um, notable political statement, like, I'll, I, I know it when I'll see it, you know? I mean, you're looking for like a needle in a haystack, but at least like you, you'll recognize it efficiently when you actually find it. Okay. <clears throat> so these are the two uh, key features at a high level of um, problems or languages that are in the thing called NP. And so in fact, roughly, I mean, I'm going to write it formally, but roughly, NP is the class of all decision problems or languages with these two features. So as I said, you know, these five languages, it's going to be a fact that all five of them are in the complexity class NP. So now I want to, you know, formally define NP. <clears throat> and I guess I still won't, I'm delaying everything, I still will not just say like definition, here's NP. I mean, uh, somehow I want a, a definition, basically I want a definition that like, you know, captures this like rigorously. And so like, it's going to, I want it to have the property that, you know, let's say three colorability is going to be in NP. So I need to set up the definition so that this is true. And you know, what I'm trying to get across here is, um, what is the real reason three coloring is in this, in NP? It's really the point one, it's the existence of this algorithm. So really, like, a language is going to be an MP if a certain algorithm exists, if a checking algorithm exists. Yeah? Uh, well, algorithms are not NP, NP or not in MP. Problems are in NP or not MP. Uh, yes, there are known uh, problems that are not in NP, and even, like, uh, like a halting problem or whatever. Um, there are like natural problems that are like provably not in NP, uh, which I could state, but maybe I'd rather tell you a problem that we highly believe is not in NP, although we can't actually prove it. And here's that problem. Uh, Un-three colorable. All the graphs which are not three colorable. It looks funny because it looks like pretty much the same problem, but actually, 
This class NP has a weird definition, honestly. It has an asymmetric definition. It's like different between somehow, we'll get to this later, but like being in the language and not being in the language. So somehow, like, if I give you a graph, I can easily certify to you that it's three colorable. If I'm somehow smart, I show you the three coloring. But like, it's not easy for me to certify that a graph is not three colorable. Like, what can I tell you that you'll easily check that makes you convinced it's not three colorable? I mean, I, maybe if I'm lucky, I could say like, hey, look, here's a, here's a, here's a copy of this subgraph in there. And then you're like, oh yeah, it's, it's not gonna be three colorable. But not every unthree colorable graph has one of these. So it's, it's not clear what to do. Yeah? But if P equals MP, right? Yeah. So you can solve the three colorable question, then you can solve that easily too. Right? So yeah, we're getting a little ahead of ourselves, but it's true that if P equals NP, which I don't believe, um, then that would mean there's a polynomial time algorithm for three colorability. And I think on like homework two, question two, part A or something, you showed that if a language is in P, then it's like complement is also in P. And indeed, if you could solve three colorability in polynomial time without any brute force algorithm, just like some crazy algorithm, well then almost by definition, you can tell if a, pro a graph is three colorable by yourself efficiently, and so you can tell also if it's not three colorable by yourself efficiently. Yep. Yes, we may get to all of this, yeah. Um, yeah. <clears throat> okay, let's get back to NP for a bit though. Uh, great questions uh, though. Um, <clears throat> yeah, so the real reason three colorability is gonna be in NP according to the formal definition that we'll give in a second, which I think even you've seen before, is because of this algorithm V. I write V because people usually call it a verification algorithm. Um, so it's an algorithm. And it's going to take two inputs, which in this lecture I'll call X and Y. And in this case of three colorability, like X is the real input, G. And this is just saying that like the checking algorithm has access to like the actual input too. Like, you don't just give the three coloring algorithm the list of colors, like you also tell it what the graph is. And this Y stands for the encoding of the candidate solution, which in this case is like a list of colors. And uh, I have to tell you that um, people also call it several different things, which these are just words, but uh, I guess you should get used to them now. Um, people often call this a witness or a, uh, a certificate. Although you should really preface this by the word potential. Because you really, it's supposed to be a witness or a proof or a certificate that this graph is in and is three colorable, but you have to check it. So that's why I prefer to call it a potential witness or a candidate witness. Um, and, you know, I'm really just describing the algorithm that's sitting here. That's what, that's what V is in this case. The verification algorithm for three colorability, you know, it, it does that thing. It checks if, you know, this is a valid coloring of G. And you know what are the things that we want out of this? Should be a polynomial time algorithm. And just here's the two bullet points which say that it's doing the correct job. This V has the property that if you give it, you know, if G really is a three colorable graph, then you know one of the candidate solutions will you know make V accept you know, the correct coloring. There exists some Y that'll make V say yes. And on the other hand, 
you know, V is, you know, doesn't just like say yes to everything. I mean, it's actually checking something. Uh, so on the other hand, um, you know, if you run a verifier, this verification algorithm on G and a list of colors, and it says accept, okay, then you actually have an assurance that this G is three colorable and it's in the language that we care about. So these two bullet points encapsulate the idea that V is properly checking that like this Y is or is not a sort of certificate or witness that this graph is a three colorable that X is in the language. Okay. So now I'll actually start to make some definitions. Um, so this is what we want to encapsulate with the definition of NP. So first, uh, let's encapsulate the second two bullet points about B doing a good job of verifying a string is in a language. So we say an algorithm, which, you know, ultimately is maybe a Turing machine, V is a verifier for language L. This is the term we're defining here, verifier for language L. Um, if, well, let me add if over there, uh, well, two properties. V takes as input two strings. You know, at a high level, X is like the quote unquote real input and like Y is this potential witness or potential certificate that X is in the language. And this is the main part. For all x, this is a very succinct way of stating it. I'm going to write a less succinct way in a second. But for every string uh, x, it's in the language if and only if there exists a y that makes v accept. I could stop there and say that's the definition of a verifier for uh, a language. But let me just expand on this star part because, you know, you'll be later in life proving things are in NP. So you'll be proving, uh, you'll have a particular V and you'll need to prove that it's a verifier for a given language. So you have to prove these two things. Well, this will be by definition. So you have to prove this star statement. And this is an if and only if, right? So whenever you're proving an if and only if, you have to prove two things, like this direction and that direction. So I'll expand those. Um, right? To prove star, you must prove two things. I'll call them one. This is usually the easier part. Well, usually they're both easy, to be honest. Um, if x is in the language, then you have to show there exists a y such that V of X, Y accepts. So like if you have a three colorable graph, then there is like some list of colors that'll make your verifier accept. This is sometimes, and I really like to call it the yes case. It's like yes, because X really yes, it is in the language and you have to prove something. <coughs> and the other direction is Two, if x is not in the language, then, uh, well, the negation of this. So for all y, v of x, y does not accept. So if you're not, if you give, if x is something that's not in the language, there's no y that will like fool that v into accepting. It's often called the no case. And let me further uh, say, 
Uh, let me write down the contrapositive of 2. I call it 2 prime. Well, it's just it's an implication, so you negate the right side and then negate the left side. It's, if there exists a y such that b of x, y accepts, then x must be in the language. So for given x, if there's some y that would make the verifier accept, then it has to be that x is in the language. OK, so you know, I've elaborated a lot on this part of the definition star over here. But let me just say, it's like a life pro tip that whenever you're proving star, you should prove, I mean, you don't have to, but I suggest you prove 1 and 2 prime. OK, star is equivalent to 1 plus 2 prime. And that's like, I think, the right way to go about proving it in most cases. Any questions? Let me leave that up just for kicks. As I said, uh, there's actually two features that you know go into really being an NP. Not only should this verification algorithm exist, but it should be efficient, meaning polynomial time. So let me add that definition. Uh, the verifier V is said to be polynomial time if, now you might say, why, wait, why are you making a definition? Like V is just an algorithm. We already know what it means for an algorithm to be in polynomial time. Well, this is a little annoying slash subtle, but uh, we have a different definition for verifier algorithms. If uh, V runs in time, which is polynomial, but just in the length of x. OK, what I'm saying here is uh, for verifier algorithms, we measure the running time just as a function of x, the real input. And I have to say, this is a bit of like a, a, a subtlety, which is a bit, it's a bit annoying that there are any subtleties here. But anyway, I'll say it. Somehow it's just going to be the right thing to do. And in, in, at a high level, I mean, why do we do this? Well, really, you know, what is the point of a verifier? It's like probably you're using it in like a, maybe a brute force algorithm like this. And like x is, so it'll be kind of maybe a subroutine potentially of a larger algorithm. And somehow x represents like the real input. So somehow it makes more sense to measure the running time as a function just of the real input. Yeah. I didn't say that. Or it will be. Uh, it need not be. Uh, I didn't say that. But it is true that um, if you know that you have a polynomial time verifier, then when you're looking at uh, this condition, like, gee, I wonder if there's a y that makes v accept x, y, there's no point in looking at y's that are like exponentially long compared to x. Because, and this is like kind of this annoying subtlety, um, you know, this thing runs in polynomial time in the length of x. So it wouldn't even have time to read all of those characters. So in some sense, if you're only going to care about polynomial time verifiers, which we are, then you could say, then you could restrict this to just there exists polynomial lengthwise that make the verifier accept. Because the verifier is only going to have time to read polynomial length strings anyway. OK. <clears throat> Good question. Good question. So I mean, actually, uh, I'm defining it the way it is in Sipser, for example. But not everybody defines NP in this way. Like some people like explicitly say 
that this y has to be of polynomially bounded length, but uh, somehow I agree with Sipser, I'd rather do it this way, even though it's a bit subtle. <clears throat> okay, so here is the final definition. Uh, NP is just uh, the, the set of all languages L, such that L has a polytime verifier. Okay, so after all that buildup, this is our definition of this complexity class, NP. And um, I hope you at least more or less see the idea and, and you know, and even all the aspects of the fact that these problems like the ST path and Hamiltonian path and three colorability are all problems in NP. Because kind of set up the definition of NP to like try to exactly encapsulate what's going on here. Uh, nevertheless, <clears throat> This is a tricky definition. I will now like prove some things are in NP. Any questions before we go on? Yeah. So if we believe that P doesn't equal MP, does that mean the function is not in NP? We also believe they're not we can't send them to uh, yes. The question was, if we believe P does not equal NP, does that mean if you have a problem that's not in NP, then you can't solve it in polynomial time? If I, if I understood the question correctly, it's really just the same as asking, is it true that every problem in P is also in NP? That is true, and I'll prove it at the end of the lecture. So maybe it's worth saying actually right now, though. Uh, you know, just so it's not too confusing. I'll mention or uh, prove later that actually every language in NP is also in P. So NP is like all the problems in P plus more. And conversely, I'll also show that every language, no, I won't show, you'll show on the next homework, that uh, every language in NP is in exp, exponential time. So it's, uh, it's not like every problem is in NP. Any problem in NP is uh, worse in exp, exponential time. Okay, let's show a problem is in NP, and in fact, it'll be not one of those five problems I mentioned. It's like yet another problem. Uh, squares. This is basically the decision problem. I give you a number. Is it a perfect square? So all the uh, numbers. And I'm gonna actually, I'm gonna like show this is an NP like super pedantically because you know it's the first one. Um, so eventually, we won't be quite as pedantic, but let me be super pedantic on this one. It's all the strings x, such that x is the encoding of a number b, which is itself a perfect square. So it's this language. 0, 1. What's the next string? It's in zero, zero, 01 star. <laughs> yeah, 100, zero, zero, and 1001, um, 11001. Okay. All the binary strings that represent numbers that are perfect squares. I'm not going to lie to you, this, this language is actually in P, but. Uh, you have to think a little bit to see why that's the case. It's easier to show this NP, actually. So that's what we'll do. Theorem squares is in NP. As somebody mentioned before, even though those are both capital letters, this is a language. This is a collection of languages. This is a complexity class. <clears throat> well, let's see the proof. If you look at the definition of NP, it's all the languages such that L has a polynomial time verifier. So like such that there exists a polynomial time verifier for L. So we have to prove a there exists statement where like there exists a verifier. So like the format of the proof is clear. Like we're going to say here's a verifier. Here's an algorithm V. Let's check that it's a polynomial time verifier for squares. So here we go. Here's the proof. Actually. Uh, 
this proof I'm going to like omit like one slightly annoying subtlety, which maybe you'll notice or maybe not, but I'll come back to fix it later. And I'm skipping at it first because it's really not the main point, so I don't want to dwell on it too much. Okay, so we got to describe a verifier, like V. So here we go. Let V be the algorithm that on input, well, it's supposed to take a pair, so X, Y. Uh, this is going to be a three-step algorithm that I describe in pseudocode. Uh, step zero, what does it do? It interprets x as the encoding of a non-negative number b, and it interprets y as the encoding of a, a number d, let's say, between 2 and uh, b. Well, let me call it uh, yeah, I'll call it D. Let me just write this. Okay, and let me squeeze it all on here. Uh, step one, this is the main step, really. Compute um, D squared. And step do except if and only if c wait, d squared equals b. You know, otherwise, it rejects. That's the algorithm. <coughs> so um, it's at least so far a verifier in the sense that it satisfies the first bullet point. It takes two inputs. <coughs> OK, so to prove that. Uh, L is an NP, we have to prove that this V is a polynomial time verifier. So uh, let's first check that it's polynomial time. The main effort here is checking step one, is polynomial time. And one, this V is a polynomial time verifier. It's a polynomial time verifier for something. I have to later show that it's really checking squares. Okay, uh, and remember this is poly n time, where n is the length of the encoding of B. Okay, so remember, I mean, this is like a numerical problem. Like, you should imagine, like, B has like a million digits or something, and N is a million. It's like the number of digits of B. Um, great. So the main, you know, the main difficulty is, is step one, squaring a number. But, you know, you can do this in polynomial time of n, well, less than or equal to, in fact, n bits. We're squaring c. This is doable in, I don't know, quadratic time by the algorithm you learned in third grade of making a big tableau. It's like n rows and n digits each. OK, so uh, we just put check mark to certify that claim one is done. Okay, what is claim two? Uh, v is a verifier for squares. In the sense that we have to prove star up there. I'm going to be proving this star. So as I said, hmm. Right. As I said, you know, in life, when it comes to proof star, you should prove uh, 1 and 2 prime. So I'm continuing the proof of claim 2 here. Or I'm writing the proof of claim 2 here. As 
I said, there's two things to prove. So first, the yes case. Suppose x is in the language squares. Well, let's just interpret what that means. It means by definition of squares, x is the encoding of b, where b is a perfect square, which means it's c squared for some c. Okay, and now uh, we have to show that there exists some y that will make this algorithm accept. Somehow I got to switch between c and d. It doesn't really matter, but y will be the encoding of this c. Okay, then it's always a risk writing this word clearly, but I really think it's clear. Clearly, v will accept when you give it. accepts for y being the encoding of c. Because, now well, just look at it. I mean, this part is actually always easy. And the no case is like equally easy. <laughs> That's the end of the yes case. We're proving like two prime now. Suppose, conversely, You know, suppose you have some x and v accepts with some string y. Then, you know, I'll write it again clearly, because honestly, just look at it. The only way it can accept is if, you know, y is the encoding of some d uh, such that d squared is. Uh, B, where this is the number that X represents. So, you know, when this happens, B is a perfect square. So, so indeed, X is in the language. And that's the end of the whole proof that squares is an NP. As I said, I was being a little pedantic, but, uh, well, I want to be pedantic at least once. Any questions? It makes sense. I mean, you know, how can you check? You know, there's a brute force way to check if a number is a square. Just go through all the numbers less than it, square them, and see if you get the, the target number. You can do it more efficiently with like binary search, but this works. Okay, uh, I'm going to do another one, slightly less pedantic. I'm going to show you that uh, three coloring is an NP. Three coloring, the language of all three colorable graphs, encodings of three colorable graphs is in NP. Okay, so what's the proof? Well, as I said, I mean, to show something is NP, you have to describe an algorithm. So here we go. Let V be the algorithm that on input a pair, let me say it's G. And y, I'll rather just call it g, uh, does the following. Mm. Let me write. Okay, so it interprets y, which is a string, as you know, a list of colors. The encoding of a list of colors, one for each vertex, okay? And it's good to write this step because it tells the reader like what the verifier is kind of expecting the proof to be. Okay, and then it just, I'm describing the main part now, it goes through all edges, ij. 
and uh, rejects if it finds two colored the same way. You know, else accepts. So that's the algorithm, the verifier. And as usual, we have to check two things or prove two things. One, this is polynomial time. You know, in the encoding length of G. So all this stuff, I mean, this takes, you know, M steps basically. So I'm just going to put check mark. It is clear. You know, you can write, it is easy to see that it's polynomial time. Um, although, I mentioned before, all these proofs have a little subtlety. I'll put a little star there. I'm going to come back to this subtlety later. It's related to your question. Uh, but let me do the main part now. Uh, I have to show that this is a verifier for the language three coloring. And it'll be equally easy and obvious as with squares. Claim two. This particular V verifies the language three coloring because, well, part one, uh, the yes case. Okay, if G really is in the language, so it really is a three colorable graph, you know, by definition, it has a valid three coloring. We might call, you know, C1 through Cn. And, you know, V, given Gy, you know, clearly accepts when Y is the encoding of this three coloring. Okay, and conversely, the no case. Whenever the verifier accepts, it is true that the G part is three colorable. Sort of clear. V accepts, you know, G and some string Y. Clearly, I don't know, Y encodes a valid three coloring of G. Still a little bit pedantic, but anyway. So indeed, G is in the language. OK, that's the end of the proof that three coloring is in uh, NP. <coughs> Any questions? OK, now it's time for the subtlety that all uh, it's not a big deal, but uh, it's something. So I, I, I feel obligated to bring it up, although I don't want to dwell on it overly. But there is kind of a mistake in these proofs. So uh, can any eagle-eyed person suggest what it might be? Or at least, I wouldn't say a mistake, but like it's not totally obvious that what I wrote is correct. See if the offending statement is still on the board. Hmm. Okay, not exactly. Any suggestions? Oh, great. Maybe I'll just go on and leave it as a mystery. Okay. Um, for example, uh, 
It's not very clear. I mean, there's a little bit of an issue that this V I described for squares is really a polynomial time verifier. <clears throat> Although step one can definitely be done in time polynomial in the length of D, step two is not a problem either. Yeah? Clarification. So it should be, so in, step, in like squares, you compute D squared. Yeah. So, but you're, this is supposed to be polynomial in terms of size of x. Correct. So, like, if we give a small x but a big D, like, the very primary, we'll see. Yes. <coughs> so, I don't know if it's stop here, but when we're talking about verifiers, they should run in time polynomial in the length of their first input, like the real input. Uh, <clears throat> now, I didn't fully write what I meant here, actually, when I said, you know, the verifier, like, looks at y and sort of interprets it as the encoding of a, a number. And, you know, if you imagine doing this in Python, you've got, like, a string of zeros and ones, and then, like, you do some simple routine to, like, convert it to, like, an integer so that you can do this step of squaring it or whatever. Well, if you're not very smart, you could potentially take more than polynomial in length of x time for this. Because, like, what if, you know, this has, like, 10 bits and this has, like, 10 trillion bits? You know, if, like, y is, like, exponentially long in terms of x. You're only allowed to run time polynomial in x. But, like, if you just go ahead and say, oh, I'm going to do this step and, like, convert this 10 trillion bit string into a number, well, friend, you just used up more than polynomial time. But, all is not lost. Yeah, we were discussing this. Yeah, so. Didn't you just say that D is less than or equal to D? Yeah, so I mean, it depends. I mean, this is why, I mean, I wanted to cheat in such a way that you wouldn't notice there was a problem, right? So it depends what I mean, or what I, you think I meant by when I said interpret Y as the encoding of a number which is less than B. Um, the thing that the verifier should not do is read this whole y that's like potentially insanely long and then like convert it to a number and go from there because then it could spend too much time. What it should do is having read x, b, let's write like n for the number of uh, the, the length of x, it knows what b is and now it knows it's verifying that b is a perfect square like there's no point in d or having more digits than b. That would make no sense. So what it should really do is, I mean, what it should really do is, you know, read the first and, you know, symbols of, of y. You know, if y is longer than that, what should it do? Yeah, it can reject. Or there's another thing it could do. Um, Another thing you could do is it could just say, eh, I'm going to call B0 and go on with the algorithm. But what it shouldn't do is like read like all the characters of Y. Um, and that's it. Like now, this step, I mean, this part is clearly going to be polynomial in N time, which is what it has to be, a polynomial in just the length of the X part. And like the, the fact that it is a verifier for squares is not wrong, right? Because it really... You know, it, it's, it's in the good case when y is what it's supposed to be, like it'll still do the correct thing. And in the no case, you're just adding more cases where it rejects. So it's fine. You see what I'm getting at here? It's, it's, I didn't want to dwell on this too much because it's like, it gets away from the actual point of the definition of NP, but, well, we're here to get everything correct. So we have to think about it a little bit. Um, yeah. In some sense, you could say that there was no problem, like, uh, like when I say, you know, really there's even more going on here. Like when you uh, interpret, or like let's say, it's written here too, interpret Y as the encoding of a list of colors. You know, this actually, this is something we talked about in lecture one and then started skipping. Like really, like included in this like little two word, two word sentence is like the part where the algorithm like checks if this string Y really is the proper encoding of a list of symbols, right? So like maybe the encoding is that like this is 0, 0, this is 0, 1, this is 1, 0. 
And then like when the algorithm gets Y and it sees like 0, 0, 0, 0, 1, 0, 0, 1, dot, 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 it's like, okay, that really stands for C1 equals red, C2 equals yellow, C3 equals B. And then there's another twist, right, where if like the next two characters are 1, you say, oops, like this string Y is not really a proper encoding of anything, so then I'll just say that it's the encoding of a default object, like all reds or something. So there's a lot hidden in this uh, sentence. But similarly here, right, what should really, the verifier should really do is it should, you know, get the string Y and start converting it to a data structure or an array that holds like the colors. And if it, if Y is more than, you know, um, like two times N, then it can just reject. Or, you know, because this is only supposed to be like maybe two bits for color of 2n. Okay, so that like makes sure that like the algorithm does not take more than polynomial time in the, the representation size of g. See what I'm getting at? Any questions here? So in the future, it's like annoying, I mean, it's an annoying point. So in the future, like, or when you're writing homeworks and so forth, you should definitely always write a step zero that looks like this. But I won't allow, uh, require you to like elaborate on this point I've just been discussing unless it's for some bizarre reason like not obvious, okay? So like when you write this, I'm gonna like mentally assume, the TAs will mentally assume like the verifier is not doing something preposterous like reading all of Y even if it's potentially exponentially long. You know, it's just doing the obvious thing. Okay, great, let's never talk about this again. <laughs> uh, okay. Great. Okay, we've got 13 more minutes. Let's uh, talk just a little bit about P and NP. We're gonna talk about it much more in the future, but you know, one thing to note is that, you know, contrary to what you might hastily remember, potentially from, I don't know, 251 or something, the problems that are in NP are not necessarily like difficult problems. NP is like a more, as we'll see, it's, it's like a broader class than P. So for example, the squares problem, it's in NP, it's actually not hard. You can solve the squares problem actually in polynomial time, even in nearly linear time. It's just checking if a number is a perfect square. Well, you have to think a, bit, a little bit about how to do that, but it's, it's actually easy. Okay, so I don't not naturally think that like NP means like some hard problem necessarily. There are some problems in NP which seemingly are super hard, but not all problems in NP are. So I mean, uh, at a super high level, right, let me just remind you, roughly speaking, you know, P, what is that? P is all the um, problems, decision problems, where, you know, deciding if there's a good solution you know, genuine solution, this is not a theorem or anything, I'm just roughly comparing P and NP, can be done efficiently. And what is NP? It's the problems where checking, you know, or verifying if a candidate solution is good, you know, it's a genuine actual solution, can be done efficiently. Okay, and you know, as we all know, like it's, you know, easier to check that somebody has correctly done a jigsaw puzzle than to actually do the jigsaw puzzle in the first place. Um, Okay, so what, are the, what is the relationship between P formally and uh, the classes that we've already talked about, which is basically just polynomial time and exponential time? Well, as I said, uh, we'll show that P is a subset of NP, and NP is a subset of exponential time. Actually, this one will be on the homework. Um, in Sipser, he states this, but he doesn't prove it, so you can prove it. Um, and I'll prove this to you in 10 minutes. 
Let me just um, say, though, before I get into it, you have three complexity classes here, three collections of languages. And uh, we actually definitively know a relationship between two of them, p and exp. So recall that p does not equal exp. p is a strict subset of exp by the time hierarchy theorem. There are problems that you can solve in exponential time that you cannot solve in polynomial time. <coughs> so these two sets are unequal. Uh, so therefore, I mean, it has to be the case that either p does not equal np or np does not equal x. And let me just spell it out, or both. You know, np cannot simultaneously equal both of p and x because p and x are different. Um, so it's funny, like, we cannot prove this, so we cannot prove this, but we can prove that the or of them is true. We actually believe this. They're both different. OK. So uh, now I'm going to prove this now. Question? Is that we don't know if n is equal to x for now? We don't. What about, like, like checking if a Turing machine holds into the that uh, not known. It might be. Uh, yeah, I guess it might be. <laughs> Probably not. <laughs> okay. So let's prove that um, P is a subset of NP. Well, these are um, these are two sets. I'm trying to prove that one set is in the other set, a subset of the other set. Well. There's only one way to do that. You say, I have to show for any element of the set on the left, p, it's also an element of the set on the right, np. The proof, I would say, basically writes itself. I mean, you can almost just start writing all the obvious steps until you've written the proof. So as I said, you know, the only way you can do this is say, you know, let L be an arbitrary language that's in P. We want to show that L is in NP. OK. Well, let's expand the definition of the only thing we know, that L is in, N is in P. So since L is in P, what does that mean? It means there exists a polytime Turing machine or algorithm, it doesn't matter at this point, uh, m, such that, well, x is in L if and only if m, when run on x, accepts. OK, so now we have to show that L is in NP. As you know, to show that a language is in NP, like the first step is, say, check out this verifier algorithm. So let's do that. Consider uh, the Turing machine V that on input x, y. Well, let me ask you now. So what does what should V do? I mean, you should think about it in the same way. I mean, um, x is the real input. We're curious if it's in L or not. Well, I mean, even think about it. Like, how would you, <coughs> like in three coloring, one like picture you can have in your head, and we'll talk about this actually in more detail later, is, you know, you're a poor polynomial time algorithm. You really want to know if this graph is three colorable or not. You're like, man, I'm polynomial time. I really don't know what to do. Perhaps a helpful person comes along and says, check out this list of colors. That's good for you, but you're a skeptical of this mystery person that dropped a list of colors on you. So you, you say, well, I'm going to check your, check your work. OK, and then, but you know, in polynomial time, you can check that the coloring is valid. And then you can you know, say to yourself, all right, this x is definitely three colorable. Or if it's not valid, you don't know that it's not three colorable, but you just said, hey, I wasn't fooled at least by this. So similarly, I mean, uh, you have to ask yourself, what do you want? Like, 
your goal here in life is to try to check if x is in the language L, it would be great if like, some person would give you what, then you could do what you need to do. Yeah. In the back? That's right. Uh, you, you're like, hey, I got this. Like, I, don't, I don't even need anything. I can check for myself if x is in the language in, in polynomial time. You know, I got this. So like, step zero is nothing. I mean, you don't interpret y as anything. You're just like, never mind. One, just do m of x. You don't, I mean, you don't even need like, you don't even need like a simulator. You just make v the Turing machine that ignores the y part and just literally has the same states as m otherwise. Okay, so then, all right, we have to prove the two claims. Claim one, v is a polynomial time verifier. I mean, in your homework, don't just write a check mark, like write at least a sentence, <laughs> but uh, I mean, you know, the only subtlety is that v should run in time polynomial only in the length of x, but well, it does, right? Let me write it, right? I mean, v x y runs in poly x time, clearly, because m does. Okay, and claim two. You have to check that it's really a verifier for L. Oh, so finish time erasing. B verifies L. There's always two points we have to show if x is in L, we have to show that there exists a y that makes v of x, y accepts. What y should we choose? Literally doesn't matter. You can choose the empty string, say. It could literally be any string at all. Uh, v of x, y will just, you know, be m of x, which will be accept as desired. And, you know, if conversely, v on input x and y accepts, clearly by the definition of v, m of x must accept. So indeed, x is in the language. That's it. Okay, any questions about that? squares or something, and you have m of x, yep. but then you pass in like multi y, like? Uh, well, are you still talking about the same verifying algorithm? question. Like, imagine L is squares. In this case, uh, we've implicitly described two distinct polytime verifiers for the squares algorithm. One of them, we de described it like super explicitly. It interpreted the y as a number, then it squared that number, then it checked if that squared number was equal to the real number, and uh, accepted it or not. That proved that that verifier prove that um, squares is an NP. Here we're actually being a little bit less explicit because, I mean, we're, you have to take it a bit on faith. I told you that the squares problem is actually in P. So there's a Turing machine that checks if a number is a square. The simplest such Turing machine I know basically does the same thing. It searches for a square root, but it does it with binary search. So that's a bit more subtle. You have to think a little bit that it's in polynomial time, but that more complicated machine, M, is polynomial time and does check if a number is a square. And uh, so this this verifier, although I, I also called it V, maybe I should call it V2, is a different verifier. But it, also, it works in quite a different way, but it also has the property that it verifies the squares language. So this is like another proof that squares is in NP. 
So like, you know, if a language is in NP, there need not be like a unique verifier that works. There could be many different verifiers that have the desired property. Okay, so let me just end by saying, you know, the question that we're going to get into even more later is, is P equal NP? And um, it's like, you know, is checking a solution as easy as finding it? Or as, you know, some people like to say, you know, is like, is uh, creating something as easy as like appreciating a, a well-created thing? Um, and one thing that's upcoming is, I mentioned it before, but this is, uh, um, you know, this is saying that this is a subset of NP, so to say that they're equal would be to say that every language in NP is also in P. It's a very strong statement, like every single language in NP should be in P. What we'll see is this theorem called Cook-Levin theorem, which says that this holds if and only if 3SAD is in P. We won't see this directly next time, but we'll see it in a couple lectures. So all the infinitely many languages in NP are in P, in NP or NP, if and only if this one single language, which is in NP, is in P. Okay, see you next time. There'll be a new homework.